Okay, so without further ado, I'd like to uh, introduce Yanni Sippis, Senior Vice President at Collier's International, to discuss uh, the Marriott uh, Long Wharf property. Terrific. Thank you very much, Chris. Let me just start the technology here. I'm not sure if you would mind. Okay. Point uh, If people can't hear me, please let me know. I'm a little more comfortable not using a microphone, and it's a little more personable anyway. Uh, as Chris said, my name is Yanni Sithis with the firm of Collier's Meredith and Brew, and it's a pleasure to appear before you this afternoon and be with all of you. Uh, we'll be presenting what we call the Mary Long Wharf Canyon Activation Project, uh, and some of the detail uh, momentarily. So if we can have the first slide, please. Okay. Chris? Uh, first, we'll just say a word about the project team uh, and the component parts, although this is a very modest project, it, it still takes a village. The owner of the Mary Long Wharf is Sunset Hotels. They're on the main Austin is the Austin Park Plaza. Uh, the operator of the hotel is very international. He had a picture of Virginia here. There, who's the general manager of the hotel, who many of you may know by face. Uh, we're the project manager for the assignment. The architect is Elvis and Freddy. Uh, legal counsel is Wilson and Stewart. And Adam Hundley is also here. That's Adam. Uh, Turner, special projects, the reconstruction services provider. So Turner will be doing the construction uh, here. And then Carol R. Johnson, a local landscape architecture firm, is the landscape architect. So what we'd like to do, why don't we start with the overview. Next slide. If you're here, you're familiar with the site. Uh, certainly you're very familiar with the area at Long Wharf, uh, bounded by the Greenway to the west, uh, State Street, so the local way to the south, and the uh, near railroad parking lot uh, to the east, and the Christmas Promise Park to the north. We'll get into some detail momentarily. But we'd like to start with a little ancient history. Because it's in order to understand the real background for why we're proposing what we're proposing, it's important to kind of rewind the clock and, uh, and look at the, the Boston's waterfront. You know, this view is from 1946, right after World War II. Uh, the waterfront was a complete decay in heaven for many decades. It's hardly the place that anybody wanted to develop anything, make any kind of investment. Uh, if we look at the next slide, uh, not only was it in decay, but it tended to catch fire. Some of them were even accidental. <laughs> This is, this is a, uh, from the 1960s, and it was out of this pattern of blight and decay and disinvestment of uh, the Boston Redevelopment Authority and the Great Boston Chamber of Commerce in the mid-1960s developed uh, a new plan, a major bold plan for the future of Boston's downtown waterfront. Look to the next slide. Uh, and this was the vision which was developed in the mid-1960s. This was a pretty bold vision at, at, at the time because of the decades of disinvestment and the fires and the blight. Uh, that was going on down there. Obviously, we can orient ourselves. This was the then uh, grand spanking new elevated central artery uh, across the harbor to the east. But the plan was basically to scrape away almost everything east of the central artery and just completely start fresh. Okay, so this was a very bold vision at the time. Uh, this vision uh, has come to fruition largely over the past 40 or 45 years. But in order to, to catalyze the creation of this vision and to catalyze the level of investment that was required to get this vision off the ground. And the vision was primarily to, to have the area become a principally residential community with recreational amenities and, and also some hotel amenities. Some compromises had to be made in order to, to bring the vision to fruition. Uh, the most obvious compromise is that these four short towers, uh, these two got stacked on top of these two, and that's how we get our towers today. But another very important compromise that was made, a notable compromise, uh, was that this was going to be the site of a hotel. At the time, it was referred to as a motel. I think Victor would have projected that today. Uh, but this is going to be the site of a hotel. The current Marriott Longmore site uh, includes all of this, all the way back to the Greenland. So one of the other compromises that ultimately was made, this is in the 70s, was to move away from the very strong uh, access that Old Atlantic Avenue uh, was providing, the strong connector, uh, and to allow these two parcels to be connected with the building. There is still, as everybody knows, a pedestrian connector that runs through the Marriott Long Wharf, but it's not open air in the same sense. So this was another uh, compromise or trade-off that was made in order to catalyze development in this area. So moving forward, I'll just give you a little bit of uh, history. Here's from right around 1980 when some of the existing buildings had been cleared. This is the foundation of the old Quincy Market, uh, 
cold storage warehouse company. You can still see some of those foundation vaults that didn't work out in the BRA parking lot today. It's pre very long more construction. This slide here, you can see the very long more actually under construction. You can still get some sense by looking at the surroundings. It was a pretty gritty area. Uh, and it still was not an inviting place. It wasn't the place that it is today, you know, bustling with people and activity and retail and, uh, and investment. And what that ended up meeting from the standpoint of the architecture of the Marriott Hall was that it was kind of designed to keep everything going on inside safe from everything going on outside, which from today's perspective is a very unfortunate outcome. Uh, so let's move forward. So this is, a, this is obviously a current view, or almost current view, which we call the vision in progress, because the vision still isn't done. And it still hasn't really been fully realized. And part of the reason is because of some of those trade-offs that were made you know, over time in the mid, mid 60s to mid 70s. So certainly the Marriott Long War, it, it accomplished the objective that it was said that it was meant to at the time from a redevelopment perspective, the broad activity uh, in terms of hotel use down to the waterfront. But the architecture of the building, and many of you are probably very familiar with the story behind the architecture of the building, and the very director who lost his job over the architecture of the building, and all that uh, you know, the background that went, that went into that. That, that, might be a, that might be a story for a different day. <laughs> Suffice it to say that this was not the, the city's, the PRA's first pick as far as the architect uh, of the building, but there were other, other factors at play. Uh, but we'll, we'll talk about what that means in terms of experience, the pedestrian experience on the ground. So the vision still has a ways to go because some of the original uh, priorities and objectives still haven't been achieved, primarily because of some of the trade-offs that were made in order to catalyze development in a way that nobody wanted to develop. It. So on the next slide, when we look at the existing condition, again, everybody's familiar with this, so we don't want to belabor the point, uh, but there is nothing inviting, nothing permeable, nothing active about the current edges of the eastern half of the Marriott Long Wharf. This is obviously the site of Christopher Holmes Park. Uh, if you go to the next slide, it seems that the highest and best use of this area is <laughs> the washrooms. I think this is from first night, probably the best best place to, uh, to stick up. Uh, if we, as we round the corner, it's inconceivable today with the clean and active and vibrant harbor that we have that a two-story brick wall would be the harbor front face of any development uh, on the downtown waterfront. And yet that's what was built in, in 1982, uh, because again, the, the mission was to protect everything inside and everything outside, and, and the surroundings of the area on the of the time uh, were certainly not very inviting. So we're left with some conditions today, and maybe there's one other slide. Is it? There we go. Uh, this is another view looking back uh, towards the you know, very active node on the Greenway and the Hall of Market. Almost no activity at, at this, you know, in this area of the, uh, of the surroundings currently. Next slide. And even from Christopher Corbis Park, which is one of the city's most wonderful public parks and a great water for open space, it's a visually, and in terms of activity, it's a dead stop when you hit that wall right there because it's impenetrable, there's no activity, there's no retail, there's no anything that would invite somebody to uh, gravitate in that direction. Everything is of the end of Long Wharf, or obviously there is the pedestrian uh, connector through the middle of the ground. But it's, it seems like such a lost opportunity. So when we think about the future here, because remember that this architecture and this outcome, this urban design outcome, was the result of a compromise. And it was the result of a very, very different time in the history of Boston's waterfronts. So when we think about the opportunity here, um, you know, when we sat down to we start to think about this some months ago, it was clear that, that this was the major opportunity to introduce some activity, to introduce new uh, uses in the area. Uh, but the bottom line is the Marriott Long World, despite, perhaps in spite of its architecture, especially at the eastern half, does extremely well. It's consistently through Victor's good offices, you know, one of the best performing Marriott's, full serve Marriott's nationally. So it's, it has 412 uh, hotel rooms and it's always changing. It, it's, it's much, much too valuable to think about just undoing what was done before, thinking about spreading it away and starting the work. Even if there were an opportunity to create more density on the site, it's just not, not going to work. So the strategy very quickly shifted to what kind of modest, but still very meaningful, incremental investment could be made in the existing facility in order to, to contribute more uh, significantly to the public realm, to 
contribute to the public's access to and enjoyment of the water's edge and even beyond to the watershed beyond. So that was the strategy that we ended up adopting. So in terms of summarizing what we'd like to do and the vision for the future of the eastern half of the area of water work on the next change, we get some bullet points. As I mentioned, we want to focus on making modest investments, incremental investments in the existing facility rather than scraping it away and trying to do something else uh, entirely, which you know, depending on one's point of view, architecturally might be preferable, but it's, it doesn't work because of the value that's resident in the existing asset. Uh, so basically, we want to wrap the waterfront in on all three sides of that eastern end uh, with more active and inviting uses of 20,000 square feet total of retail and restaurant use. Maybe three to four individual spaces, and we'll show you the plan in just a moment. Uh, we want to replace the opacity that today that they dominates that end of the, of the property with transparency as much as possible. There's the use of glass and doors and so forth. We also want to reinforce the State Street access, which kind of peters out past the Marriott Long Wharf's entrance and then takes back up again uh, when you get out for the Garland Long Wharf. We also, on the other side, want to extend the Faneuil Hall and the Faneuil Marketplace, Retail Main Street. I'll show you what that looks like in just a moment. And then lastly, the one, when we talk about extending the pedestrian experience not just to the waters that we are, uh, and out to the water sheet known as Boston Harbor, we see this given the Long Wharf North docking area, we see this as a real opportunity to improve the visitor experience of the Boston Harbor Islands, right? the city Lewis National Park, and the great you know, civic opportunity to see in the general sense. So there's a lot of opportunity here, and I want to show you the plan. So again, Oregon itself, we'll spend some time here. So Oregon itself, obviously, we have Greenway right here, this one is parked in the north. Uh, we have the Boston Harbor on the east of the State Street. And what we want to do is not necessarily turn the hotel inside out because of the existing uh, ballroom and other functions that exist on the ground floor of the hotel and the washrooms and so forth. It would be hard to make more transparent. But what we'd like to do is to add a series of one-story pavilions, retail pavilions, very glassy uh, retail and restaurant pavilions, all along the existing edge, the big edge of the Long Wharf property. As everybody knows, this, this pedestrian uh, connection will continue to exist uh, in a general sense with respect to the interior of the hotel. Sunstone has just spent, uh, I think, over a, a little over $30 million on some interior improvements. Uh, there's also a couple of other smaller incremental investments that we think would be possible on the Greenway edge where the uh, tour bus chantings are today, or enclosures are today, uh, potentially long term, the TS patio. Uh, is an area where that use could perhaps fall uh, and perhaps be enclosed in a more four season or three season uh, environment uh, as well. It's also important to point out another component of this plan, which is already completed, which is the recent addition of a series of public uh, bathrooms on the ground floor, which are now complete for all the remote to use them. Uh, and, and that was, uh, although that wasn't required in the uh, the uh, area of Montmore's existing chapter in one place, we felt like it was a, you know, an important step in the right direction as we re-envision the entire uh, area around the Mary Long Wharf. All of this takes place on property already part of the Mary Long Wharf site, so there's no, uh, there's nothing occurring on, on BRA property or, or any other public property. It's all within the existing property line. Uh, and certainly the pedestrian connection that exists today would be recreated uh, on the very eastern edge. But instead of walking past a two-story high point wall, one would be walking past uh, an active and inviting retail restaurant use of that location. A couple of other key themes that this sort of vision uh, represents is connectivity. Uh, State Street, the rock to the sea, is a very important connector uh, for a number, from a number of different perspectives, uh, tourism and civic and, and otherwise, it's going to see the transportation. But also, as we sort of zoom out, the thing of a marketplace, retail Main Street, that goes through Marketplace Center lines up perfectly. It's right down the barrel uh, of uh, what used to be South Market Street, right through here. So to continue, because we know Marketplace is 20 million visitors a year, uh, so if we can draw even a fraction of those visitors beyond the the uh, the, um, the Fayetteville Marketplace environment, out onto the Greenway, visit the Islands Pavilion, straight down the barrel of a newly enlivened, vibrant, attractive uh, retail corridor. Uh, and then with the new Copper Islands you know, ticketing center 
integral to uh, one of those retail pavilions. We think that would be a, a win 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 from all perspectives in terms of driving traffic and focus the use of enjoyment of the water. A couple other slides. Uh, one thing to point out, because this is an hour plan uh, context, so we want to be very cognizant of power plan related issues. Uh, the open space that would be uh, occupied by the, the, by the proposed retail pavilions, although it's certainly not attractive, it's certainly not usable, it's not particularly remotely about it, it is open space with capital. <coughs> so we are trying to kind of think ahead a little bit and anticipate where, how we might offset uh, some of that uh, occupancy of existing open space with more active uses. And the obvious uh, thought that we had is, is this parking lot uh, right here, just beyond the eastern <coughs> edge of the area, which is owned by the VRA uh, and, and you know, roughly the same size as the footprint that was being proposed. Most importantly, from a project perspective and a regulatory perspective, there is there's a, a true nexus between this site and what's being proposed around Mary Bonmore, both obviously in terms of proximity, but also in terms of concurrency, uh, because the time frame in which this project can occur, uh, which is in the relatively near term, uh, we think that this is a viable concept anyway. So on the next slide, we've, uh, well, here's an existing condition that shows that the existing parking lot adds very little to the quality of the public realm uh, or the public's access to or use of the water's edge. And on the next slide, we've, with Carol R. Johnson's assistance, we've sort of taken one vision of what that might look like, kind of a mix of softscape and hardscape. Certainly there would be a buffering element uh, in terms of uh, sea level rise and storm events. There, there's, uh, there's an element that could help to buffer uh, A, the chart house building, and B, the eastern edge of the area from, from any kind of wave action or splash over. So we think that that site has a lot of potential uh, for a variety of reasons. That's great. The conclusion. All right. So that was a lot of words in a short period of time, but obviously we're very happy to answer, answer any questions about the vision. It's not a project, it's not a proposal, it's a vision. But that's, that's what we have here. Any questions from the advisory committee?
restaurants, the hotel, um, it may be closed when the new flooring utilized as well, or at least a part of the building. Do we scum it for you? Yeah. Um, just a couple of things. <coughs> First, you know, um, I'm very glad to see that you guys are, um, are thinking about ways to improve the present conditions. Um, and just before we get off the parking lot, um, to point out that no matter where we go with this, there's a um, there's a fairly active water sheet there. And, um, and there is, is some requirement that vendors and boat uh, owners be able to get at least two decimal that they would need to have a chasing target and not saying that, but just have to figure out how to do that. And you know, um, I know you presented this why wouldn't you um, you know some uh, sort of uh, mitigation that's similar in kind as you're talking about. But there are other ways to mitigate. So that that's not the way that the VRA should proceed. I, I would say that if we have one thing down here, we have lots of harbor and plenty of green space in here, maybe there are other things that might work well. I'm not, I have just two comments, and one's about the vision and the second's about the present condition. Um, I, I spent quite a bit of time on that site. I mean, um, all of my Boston University classes, I have a class today on site and it's a terrific place to be. Um, it used to be better than not to use the fast food. And I just want to tell you why. Um, we used to be able to um, sit after spending several hundred dollars to buy Starbucks coffee um, in the lobby. Um, and those um, tables were uh, replaced by uh, a very few benches that are along the edges of the lobby, um, dramatically reducing the seating and also the utility of the space for someone who wanted to stay there for 15 minutes or a half hour or an hour as one. And the second is that the area that's adjacent to the fabulous new restrooms, which I've had the pleasure of using. Happy to have you. And they save quite a lot of time because people don't have to go in, upstairs, around the corner. Although, what a lovely thing, and you could always get a free apple up there whenever you want. <laughs> um, but um, at the, on, on the, um, North side, is that, am I, am I, on the CRISPR camera side, the, the alcove, for lack of a better term, that's um, run by, that's net adjacent to TS, that serves as the pedestrian connection, actually used to be a very terrific place. For example, I wanted to imagine that you could have three weeks of a heat wave with incredible. It's easy to imagine since we just had one. It's one of the few places where you could sit and be in shade. In the last year, um, and it's also a great place for my class to be today at Black and White. But I want to point out they're probably buying more Starbucks than per capita than anybody else is trying. Um, those tables are gone. Um, and um, I'm sort of wondering what, what, the, what the license conditions are for that space. Um, and the reason I asked it, this is not point fingers, but last year I, I assumed that there's a fairly good security because a security guard was in Spanish told my class that they should leave because it was private space. And um, it didn't feel like private space. And in fact, if it was, you could count the Starbucks stuff, so I think I know who space is. Um, can you bring the tables back and in the intro? Um, and can you find a way to maybe accommodate a little bit more seating? Or is that sort of, so, I mean, and that's sort of where you want to move. Sure. So I think the outdoor, the outdoor seating uh, yeah. could certainly be replaced and put back in. But, um, was it misused? Absolutely. Um, probably more people not buying Starbucks than people buying Starbucks. So, so, so it's a private up. space? So that's, uh, so that's a private space? I don't know. I wouldn't consider it a but private It's on the ground floor of the Marriott. So that may have just been a misinformed the It's hard to figure out how, 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 you, how, you, how, you, how you guys want, how you anticipate it and then what the license conditions currently require there so that I can have a better understanding of it. And I'll be honest And then the indoor space is more of a design element uh, from the design. Bruce, what, the questions you're asking, of course, they're all good. It relates to the present conditions, I think, that we start to make sure afterwards and that's perfect. And then, then just to say that the things that I'm, I'm, I'm concerned about the present, I'm so delighted to see um, as like driving the, the, the future vision there. And so um, I, I, I don't want my comment in any way to be viewed as criticizing where you guys want to go. And um, to be honest with you, you know, I'm fairly happy with where you were. 
Yeah. Yeah. Like where you want to go, maybe we can find a way out. Susan? Um, one of the concerns that I think the neighborhood has in this whole area, and it's not just a Marriott issue, it's a, it's a general issue, and that is the number of vendors in the booths or the trolleys, the notes, the t shirt vendors. And we can ignore the fact that they're part of this neighborhood. In any future development, we have to have an understanding of where they go and what space do they go in. Mm-hmm. Having the small kiosks, I don't think, lends um, any any um, value to the real estate of the community as it exists today. And I think that's something that we need to consider when we're doing future planning, whether it's allocating small amounts of space in some of the buildings, such as the, uh, the Marriott. But I think that's an issue that, that we have to deal with. Would you go back to the plan just quickly, Chris? Yep. This was embraced a great point, and it's especially evident at this time of year. Yes. Uh, a few slides back, but precisely because people asked the question about the dimension, the immediate dimension of that space, uh, it, it's because it's so sort of long and shallow, it's also a lot easier to subdivide. So to the extent that it makes some sense to subdivide you know, smaller portions of it to accommodate vendors who would otherwise be you know, blocking traffic out here in the, in the park, that's, that may be a real possibility. And certainly the physical box is there to do that. Because right now you have in that Atlantic Ave area, you have the Boston Physical Tours. You have the Trolley Tours. You have the there. They're just going to pop up somewhere along the sidewalk in another room. So I think Yeah, we can. Yeah, we've got Dick Mulligan coming up next. He'll be discussing the BRA property, and as you know, there have been some revisions to the vending profile and contracts. It's cleaned up quite a bit and reduced the number and the, the footprint of them on so. Yeah. Okay. I'm sorry, Bob? I'm more worried about what impact does it have on the walkway to the city? You know, what happens when people go out there and sort of get extended more and more, and the people can't walk around? So I know it's your property, but it seems obvious that every time there's a question of something that has people going outside, they stretch it out. So I'm more concerned about the walkway to the city than the other one. Good idea. Thank you. Now that, could you point out where the staging area for the taxis will be on that plan? It's not as easy as it is. That's not where they go now. You go back to your photo, you'll see right, where they are now. Yeah, but you'll go back to your plan and then the photo will exist. Back to uh, which. Uh, yeah, you need Show the existing. Going back to the area. Is it the other way? Yeah. All right. No? Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, right there. Yeah. You see all those white stages right there? Yeah. That's that's any stage. Yeah. So go, go back to the uh, yeah, but you the mentioned, is it the same? Yeah, sure. Yeah, right, now go back to your existing, go back to the plan. Or your proposed plan. Sure. Okay. So this is the yeah, you've got all along the no no no. Yeah, 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 He's taking the sort of out parcel area that goes with the hotel and coming out to the property. Line. We're certainly not impinging the public way or the sidewalk or the street. That's a great question. Okay. 
All right, one last question from the advisory committee. Uh, you mentioned that uh, the implementation would be done incrementally, and I'm going to echo the other comments about the level of the state. Thank you, Yanni. Appreciate If we just hold off on public comment to the end of the presentation, just in the interest of time, appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Yanni. Thank you. Great. All right, next we have Dick Mulligan uh, coming in from the BRA EDIC shop to discuss uh, BRA holdings in and around the Long Wharf area and um, investments and improvements made over the past 10, 15 years in the area. So just ask for your forbearance, and I'll bring up... I don't have to wait for that. Uh, my name is Chris Mulligan. I'm the <laughs> senior project manager for the asset management department of the BRA. I'm yes, a sweaty guy to walk over from the industrial block. All right. I'm to say, cool as a cucumber out here. Uh, the BRA owns quite a bit of property. We own about 9 million square feet of property around the city. The biggest pieces that we have are portions of the Charlestown area and the downtown waterfront. Those are the areas that I basically focus on. Uh, over the past nine years, the BRA has spent, along with uh, the Executive Office of Transportation of the state has spent over uh, close to a million, $11 million in infrastructure improvements in this area. Uh, the BRA owns property all the way uh, East India Road, which basically is the fire lane behind the uh, Boston Harbor Garage from Harbor Towers over to Christopher Columbus Park. So basically all the hard scale over there is owned by the BRA, with the exception of the Custom House Block and uh, the Chart House, which is owned by ELB Associates and Mary Corporation, which has an alley along with uh, 
I'm basically the guy that's the boots on the ground. Uh, I don't sit in the office a lot. I'm usually out uh, on our property making sure everything's up to snuff. I know Victor's got me on speed dial and a lot of other people. Whenever they see something wrong, we try to respond as quickly as possible. Uh, we've got some vendors out there this year, which I know that has been an improvement. For some reason, there was a, a rule that had been unwritten with the BRA that nobody could use the, the boardwalk, which is out across from legal seafoods put anything out there. So we crammed everything up on the sidewalk, which was clearly a problem with any kind of pedestrian thoroughway there and people getting by. Everybody get crowded up there and it was really unsightly. So we've moved two of the kiosks, brand new kiosks we had constructed onto the boardwalk, which I think has really uh, you know, cleaned things up quite a bit. Plus we have a couple of new uh, vendors who don't feel like they're entitled. So when I ask them to do something, they say, yeah, okay, fine. Uh, which is nice when you have a person that's a tenant of yours to actually listen to what you have to say. And it makes it easier when people call me and complain, saying, like, why didn't you do something? Well, geez, I talked to the guy and told me to take a, take a leave. Uh, so, you know, this is one of the issues that I deal with on a regular basis. Uh, the plan that Yanni showed with the parking lot behind the chart house uh, is great. You know, one of the things I always look at is some of the urban renewal plans from the late 60s for this entire area, which really tried to focus on making it as pedestrian friendly as possible. But also being the guy that's on the ground, I have to figure out where does the trash in this area go to. So the back of this parking lot in the corner, there were two dumpsters. Whenever we have full, tune, uh, full, tide, full moon, high tide, these dumpsters would tend to float on the parking lot, flooded in the back there because it's one of the low areas as well as in front of the child house and they have to put the sandbags out front when we have those high tides. Uh, so one of the things we had planned on, we put an RFP out about seven years ago to try to get a restaurant into the vent building at the end of Longworth Park to try to increase more pedestrian use and try to help, frankly help me out with the issues that I deal with on a daily basis with the homeless people that are down there and the skateboarders that have sort of taken over the area. Unfortunately, this has been tied up in litigation for the past seven years. Uh, some people uh, want to keep this as passive open space uh, because I guess there's not enough between the North Washington Street Bridge and the Commercial Wharf. It's a great location, but I think it's something that we really want to bring the public down to. We can all see the success that's happened over the Seaport District with Liberty Wharf. I think bringing more people to the waterfront, it, it makes a world-class city go anywhere else in the world. Sydney, uh, Cape Town, Auckland, they have everything, a lot of dead skin, a lot of people are like mummies, they want to go to the water. But the amount of people we have down here on booze cruises, whale watches, whatnot, this is probably one of the, the top destinations for tourists in the city of Boston. And it's a natural, it, it's a beautiful harbor, it's well cleaned up. Uh, you know, you can swim the child's right now. I swim on the harbor all the time. Uh, I recommend it, particularly in this weather, that the temperature is about 73 degrees. So it, it's something that, you know, we really have to embrace the psychological and physical barrier of the central Avenue being taken down is a great opportunity for the city of Boston to really embrace the waterfront. Uh, getting back to some of the regular stuff that I have to deal with, uh, instead of two dumpsters back at the end of that parking lot, we have a, a trash compactor that handles all the trash from the boats from Boston Harbor Cruises, which is one of our tenants out there, from the chai house and uh, from some of the vendors at that location. So this is something that you know, it's, it's great to put a park in there, but you always have to think about, okay, realistically, where are we going to put these things? I know how much bait is eaten out of every rat trap that we have down in this area. We really get down to the minutia of the things we have to deal with. It. It's things that people don't think about. Let's design the light. Okay, fine. How can I change the light bulb in there? The old mariner lights we had down there, we had to get a lift and take the head off to change the light bulb instead of having a door that you drop down and put in there. So I'm one of those kind of guys that when these plans come along, I hope that uh, people ask my opinion, and it's heated on some of the common sense things that we have to do on the waterfront. A lot of these things are uh, great and good on paper, but in reality, sometimes it just doesn't work or it doesn't fit in with uh, uh, all the issues that we have to deal with down there. Uh, the trolley tour buses, you know, I'd love to get them out on Land Gap. Same thing with tour buses. You know, 20 years to build the central lottery, okay, but we put all these tour buses. You know, they end up over in Charlestown. Uh, you go over to Italy, you go to a place like Siena. 
can't bring tour buses to those towns. They're all located outside the city center, and they have other ways of getting you in. You know, that's something the city has to look at. We have areas over Charlestown, at the end of Chelsea Street, up by the uh, Boston Auto Port. We try to send a lot of these trolley tour buses. And a lot of them just won't go out there because they have to pay $20. And that's just to get in so that these guys can relax, have a sandwich, wait three hours or whatever it is when their boat comes back. So these are some of the things that, you know, are going on behind the scenes that a lot of people don't realize. You know, how do we resolve these issues? Tourism is a very big uh, generator of the economy in Massachusetts, particularly in Boston. So it's something that we want to make a uh, pleasurable experience for everybody coming to the city of Boston. And I think this is one of the areas where a lot of people flock to. Uh, Norman Leventhal has been very generous in the past. He's put in the walkway to the sea where you can see these diagrams on the bottom which light up by LED. And in the back there is a uh, small wind turbine, which is really uh, you know, great compared to the ones that have the big wings going around. That thing gets spinning pretty good. And that powers all the LED lights on all those panels from the end of Long Wharf all the way to the top of the stage. Uh, so it's a lot of innovative uh, designs like that that I don't think people really notice unless you were looking for it. And I hope a lot of tourists see it. I see tourists down there on a daily basis reading that stuff. We want to have more interactive historic signage in this area just to show people, you know, this was a working port, uh, a port, a city of immigrants who made their living from the harbor. And we want to bring people back down there and see the revitalization that we've uh, had down there. Uh, most of the improvements that we've had down um, in this area have been on the south side of the Marriott Long Wharf, which you can see here where we have the ADA compatible uh, uh, ramp which is used for the shuttle over to Charlestown Navy Yard and to gain access to the floats down at Boston Harbor Cruises. That's uh, uh, yeah. uh, it. Yeah. Uh, we did, I think, about four or five years ago. Uh, it was a lot of work. I mean, uh, it's a historic uh, seawall, so you have to maintain sections of that and make them visible. And also, we have to put in all these piles without disturbing uh, the ongoing business on Canada at Boston Harbor Cruises. Very successful with that. We had about another 200 linear feet of uh, float space on that side of uh, Long Wharf. And on the north side of Long Wharf, I think the most uh, obvious improvements that the BRA is putting in. We've had some of the picnic tables, uh, you've seen the four lounge chairs that we, that we have out there. We've done the entire uh, harbor walk uh, from uh, ELD's property behind uh, the chat house along the perimeter of the parking lot that's back there, connecting up. We also have a new float for uh, commuter boats and for shuttles on the, uh, on the bus line, which is a portion adjacent to uh, commercial boats. So, uh, you know, I think with the plans that Yanni showed uh, with uh, the Marriott, you know, we're very excited about it. We want to open up that big plank wall and embrace the waterfront look across the hobby, you look at the housing buildings over there in the high school, and you see a black wall. There's windows all along the side, but you remember when this place, when these places were built back in the 60s and 70s, uh, you could tell when it was low tide just by snow. And we've come that far in the city and to clean up this family. So it's really something that we want to embrace. Uh, public money has been put into this funding to help spur the private development, and we hope it goes forward from there. And we hope to get more development on the waterfront. It's very important something the city must embrace in the future. Great. Thank you, Dick. Yeah, Dick made mention of uh, the walk to the sea, Norman Leventhal's uh, uh, exemplary um, uh, walk to the sea pathway. Uh, the BRA also uh, commissioned a study back in 2007 with Roland Baresi, um, sort of a historical interpretive uh, design uh, to better connect Long Wharf to State Street, um, the old State House and Faneuil Hall. This is just a, uh, a graphic from that which called out uh, various locations and, and uh, situations where uh, historical interpretive signage and interpretive elements can be integrated into the wharf structure. So this is a, a sort of a foundation document that could be utilized in our, our public realm activation component as this uh, planning process proceeds. Uh, but any uh, questions from the advisory committee for, for Dick? Uh, this this um this a mix of this is on the north side. Yep. 
this dock here is owned by the MBTA. Um, all the other docks are owned by the PRA. Uh, but we used EOT, Executive Office of Transportation, now Mass Dock Money, to build out the water transportation infrastructure and to improve um, the power um, in the docks. Um, this area here, I think, as Dick mentioned, is leased to Boston Harbor Cruises. And this area here on the north side to Boston's best cruises. Our other leaseholder is Boston Water Marina, which leases that water sheet for a marina. All right, Bruce? Um, you have a lot of really practical experience here. And, it's, um, and so I just want to ask you just the general question. Um, um, there's been a lot of discussion about the late night conditions in the area. There's been a lot of discussion about uh, an appetite for uh, what some people call 24-7 activity. And although, when you really push it, I'm not sure whether it's really 24 The bars in the Daniel Hall area and the North End, and, and I think probably you know, it's all this, uh, they close at 2, is that correct? It uh, varies between you know, 12, 12, the latest. Um, and, um, and, and I assume that from time to time you've had reports or you know what, what the conditions are between two and when the joggers should start up. What's the situation? You know, we don't have as many instances with uh, the drinking in the bars. Uh, it's really very well behaved. I, I go to security meetings once a week over at Massport and they take care of everything in the Arab, which is downtown water on the scene. You'd be amazed with the amount of people that we have down there and the drinking that naturally goes with it, how little crime there is. I had a huge spurt of vandalism uh, in March and April this year, kicking out a lot of the ballasters and uh, stopping through, I don't know whether someone was driving on the on the walkway behind the, the uh, parking lot there, but it, 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 you know, just malicious destruction. And people were taking off the, the name plates, the, uh, the, the, the brass plaques on ELV. So they finally, after having eight of them stolen, they just took them all off. Uh, it is constant vandalism down in the vent building at Long Wolf. And it's just something that, you know, I, I, if it was up to me, I'd, you know, get the van down there, uh, bring them to the shack, bring them to uh, Long Island, someplace where they get help and assistance. A lot of the people that are down there are from the, 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 uh, the homeless veterans shelter up the street, uh, you know, it's a tough problem. You know, you can't just say, get rid of them. you got to get them help. Uh, I know Bud Reese probably sent me an email saying, you know, we counted 39 homeless people sleeping out there last Thursday or Wednesday. Uh, so I'm glad he sent me that email. And we notified the city's emergency shelter. So yeah. good. And they had vans down there that night, I think. Right? It was probably maybe one or two people the next day. So, I mean, the city has the services. Uh, you know, what I, I think most people have my cell phone number. You know, I depend on people's eyes and ears. I can't be everywhere at once. I'll be at daily. Uh, you know, on weekends, I go to my boat, which is over at Commercial Wharf. So I'm down there all the time. But if something's happening, you know, I expect people to call me. And they do. If I'm down there, if I see a trash barrel that's full, I call our contractor, which is Compass Facilities, and they just got another three year extension on that contract. Call them up. They have a guy down there that takes care of it. They take the trash out. You know, the trash in all those barrels down there, we don't put them in contact. They get, that gets trucked off site. So it's, it's these little things that you know, people tend not to think about that I have to deal with on a regular basis. Uh, the same thing, the, the biggest aggravation I have is the portion of Lower State Street where there's all brick and granite, which is all torn up. I watched for six months as these guys were on the hands and knees putting the stuff down. I'm just going like, why? You know, we went through and went it, it was all torn up. But it's, the state still owns it. It's part of the Central Lottery Project. So when someone calls me and says, get the city down there and fix it, well, that portion of the roadway isn't the city's because they won't accept it from the state, which is why all our property down there is uh, pressed by tumors and painted, so it looks like brick. And it's very low maintenance, and you're not gonna worry about twisting or breaking an anchor when you want to apply it. So, I mean, it's these, these, these little things that, People don't think about it. I deal with it, and people say, like, "Why does the state just own this little portion of the roadway? Why don't they do something?" Like it? Well, they did. They spent a ton of money on it, and it was ruined. Really the, the reason that I, I asked the question is because um, you know when you go there in the day, and not just something stands out. If you walk at Park Towers, you know, walking 
you know, work for us. The actually most visible sign that you see is a red and white sign that says the white on your side. And um, if you're there during the day, folks, you might get the sense that they're worried that you're going to stay there. And, and, and in a way, I think maybe there aren't any other no loitering signs. Well, I'm going to try to put some up at the vet building because that's the way well, do they, so they can enforce it. Is that, is that critical to the enforcement? It is. It is because police uh, or anybody else that wants to go down there, they can't move anybody along. I mean, it's public. Whereas the private property owners can put those signs out there. I can't. I have to encourage the public to come and use our property, which means it gets beat up an awful lot, which means it has to be maintained properly. You know, we spent $50,000 on the bottom of park with new, uh, you know, we re relaying a lot of the granite pavers and uh, routing all the all the um, all the blocks, of the, all the cobblestones, you know, because that gets screwed up every winter. And so it's you know another fifty thousand, sixty thousand every spring. Keep everything up to snuff. But the, the money that is generated from the vendors that we have down there all goes into paying and maintaining that area. So it's very important. People say get rid of the vendors. That's great, but you know I need a revenue stream in order to maintain this property. States all day. Our signage. Well, I mean, the parks, the Christopher Cummings Park, the parks departments, the parks are open from dawn to dusk, and I think that will post the same thing. We want to encourage as much public access as possible, but they may be able to do that, but again, it's supposed to have an enforcement and consistency. In chapter three. Bud? Just a couple points. I'll speak as a poll on We can move on to uh, our next property, 255 State Street. Uh, we've got uh, David Lucy, head of uh, U.S. Operations with Pembroke Real Estate. Thank you, Chris. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. My name is David Lucy. I'm the uh, head of U.S. Operations for Pembroke Real Estate, uh, who represents the owner of 255 State Street. Uh, I'm here today with my colleague, Andy Dankworth. Andy is the Director of Project Management at Pembroke. And uh, Chris has, had asked us to come today to talk a little bit about 255 State Street, in particular, um, what it was like when we bought it, what we've done to it, and what we're thinking about going forward. So um, Andy and I have agreed that we're going to split up this presentation a little bit so you don't have to hear from either of us for too long a period of time. So I'll start with Andy, uh, and Andy's going to talk about the history of when we acquired the property, what it was like then, and what we've done to it during our period. Thanks, David. 
Um, the, uh, the property is really unique. It's one of those few properties that kind of survived the uh, scraping that happened of a lot of the old buildings uh, the uh, Central Artery was built. And it's also unique in Boston because it does have unfettered 360 degree views, which is um, something our tenants really value. Um, the building, uh, we bought the building from um, 9X, which I guess used to be New England Telephone. And back in uh, those days, that's about 1946, I think, that shot, you can see the, uh, there is no, I'm sorry, uh, yeah, I think it is, it's, it's, there's no central artery. Um, the building was attached at some level, probably to the west, to the other north buildings. And you can see that old Atlantic Wharf is the one that runs along the uh, waterfront. Um, the, uh, the building had a lot of telephone switch gear in there, and that's probably what kept, its, uh, kept it from being scraped over, because it needed to survive and, and provide services. We bought the building in, um, uh, let's see, it was 1997, um, from 9X, and when we bought it, there was a lot of work that we needed to do. Um, it hadn't been taken care of, there was a lot of deterioration on the facade. Um, yep, we can go to the next one. Um, what you're seeing on the facade on the bottom left was what the building used to be. It had a brick, a relatively uh, modest brick uh, exterior, but it had a very nice round and, and second floor um, uh, limestone retail with, with uh, cast iron detailing. And then it had a top floor again, uh, ornaments of limestone. We needed to remove the brick. Um, the uh, supports were pretty much completely rusted um, and not by code. We replaced it with um, Precast that resembled as close as possible the limestone, nice warm tone. And you can see on the upper right panel um, picture. Uh, the other thing that uh, we needed to do was modernize the building. Um, it had some really great spaces inside. It has the old mushroom columns that you see in a lot of the warehouse buildings that uh, we like to expose as much as we can in the fit outs. Uh, but we also had to bring in extra elevators in there and code compliancy and um, there is a basement level as well. So that sort of tells you where we were. Now I'm going to talk about where we are today. Um, it's a 220,000 square foot off, uh, Class A office building, 12 floors. The floor plates are about 19, well, I'll call them almost 20,000 square feet. Today the building is currently 97% uh, leased. Uh, it's a mix of first floor, it's, uh, we have two restaurants and an ice cream shop. So 70% of our first floor, ground floor area is open to the public. Uh, and I should point out, by the way, at the time we bought the property from 9X, that was actually a 9X cafeteria and conference room with black paneling. So we took all that off and opened it up with the, with the current retail. Uh, we have five by seven windows. You can see great views of the harbor. Uh, we did do some renovation work in the lobby. Um, it's a very small lobby. Uh, as I said, 70% of the floor area on the ground floor is Currently, two restaurants, uh, City Landing and uh, Lean Seafoods, and the balance is an Emac and Bolio. Then the rest of the space is primarily our loading dock with a very small um, lobby for our office tenants. Uh, in terms of sustainability, I'll just mention quickly I know several people have made the comment today about uh, you know, rising tides and concerns about climate change. That's something that we take very seriously. Um, our elevator machinery, as well as our, our backup generators, are actually on the roof of the building. Um, we do have other machinery in the basement that we're currently looking at ways to potentially move out of the basement. Uh, we're also, in the, in the shorter term, we're looking at things like you know, increasing our sump pump capacity, uh, doing some additional water uh, infiltration protection uh, procedures in the basement, as well as a host of other things. And I think you know, one of the things I think Andy's going to talk about is you know, we were asked other things as, as you're considering the municipal harbor plan that you know, we'd like you to take into account. And I think one of those things, and I'll let him speak to this in a little more detail, is what do you do if you have to move your equipment from your basement floor to second or third floor space? Are you supposed to say, well, I just lost, you know, I don't know, 15, 20% of the rental floor in my building, or should there be some combination for that? Andy can talk about that before. Um, we'll go ahead to the next slide. This just shows you the, the ground floor area. Many of you are probably familiar with it. Uh, Legal Seafoods does, you know, uh, an exceptional business there. Good landing's doing very well. And you'll see that we've also been able our restaurant tenants, any Mac and Bolio, to activate the sidewalk around the building. Um, all those shaded areas you see uh, uh, just below City Landing and then to the left of Legal Seafoods and then just above the Mac and Bolio, those are all outdoor seating areas. So in the good weather months, those are usually uh, filled. 
The other area you'll see is proposed. That's along Atlantic Avenue, and that's something that we're currently working on with uh, Bill Brodsky, who's the owner of Steel Landing. Uh, he would like to extend the patio seating around the corner. Um, we've had some preliminary meetings with a number of stakeholders, and I think that the, the view has been, uh, it's been pretty favorably received. The idea is you tie into the, green, uh, to the greenway more than it is, and also it would allow us to potentially have the trolleys move back a bit, which will enable people to, who are sitting in those seats to actually appreciate the greenway. And also, if I can, we're finding that it's a safety concern because people that are crossing Atlantic Avenue um, from State Street, it's very difficult sometimes to see around the trolleys. And so we, I, I personally have experienced two or three instances where I started to step out and then cars have pulled through. It's very difficult to see. And, and, and so we're hoping that we can remedy that. Um, we go to the next. And then I think going forward, what are you going to talk about that? Thanks. Um, so there's a few things that we, we've already um, started to, uh, to activate. Um, one of them is the fish sculpture on the corner, you've probably all seen that. That was a fun project that we did that used to be just dead space, and we wanted to do something that people would stop and take a look at. It was actually designed by uh, Aero Street, and it, it's um, it's manufactured sea glass, nobody collected that much sea glass. Um, but it's uh, it's a fun sculpture, um, those are, those are pod. Um, the other thing is uh, we are um, looking to um, in general, just try to improve our entrance a little bit. Uh, get the, uh, uh, I think just the awareness of where the front door is. It's a little bit hidden sometimes when you come around. Um, one of the other things I think is important is just our participation in both this forum and the members of the ABC committee. Uh, we stay in touch with uh, our neighbors uh, about, I mean, this is a no neighborhood development. I mean, this is a whole, um, uh, it's a combination of coordinated effort that we want to see this all come together. So we're excited about um, the plans we're hearing about the Long Wharf. Anything that can bring more activity to this, including the garage. You know, it's not the highest and best use for that project either. Um, the, uh, the last thing I wanted to say, and this is touching on uh, what David mentioned, is that it is a challenge for existing property owners to accommodate um, the issue of bringing equipment out of the lower levels and somehow getting it into a safe spot. We did a case study. Uh, we worked with Vivian and the Boston Harbor Association on the report, the Rising Tide report. And you know there are there are switch gear, electrical switch gear, our telecommunications is down there. There's some elevator equipment. Um, all of most of these old buildings have that stuff in the basement. Um, I think that we're at an opportunity where if we are looking at the municipal harbor plan and the greenway and all of these things, that there could be some accommodation to work with property owners that would incentivize, not penalize us for moving this equipment onto a second floor. You don't want to put it on the roof if you even have room because the more you go up, the more expensive it gets with the electrical fees. But by doing that on the second floor and, and being able to replicate that space somehow is I think um, a good way to try to bring people to the table, be proactive about this, so we don't all end up at the 11th hour trying to um, accommodate this. So I think um, with that, um, any questions? Questions from the advisory committee? Andy? Andy, um, and by the way, we do love the sea glass. Oh, thanks. Oh, so what sort of accommodations are you thinking about? Well, in the end, if we are displacing tenant space, so say we've got probably a quarter of the floor down there um, to about 5,000 square feet that's got to, would have to move. Uh, if we put that on the second floor, we would try to look for roof space, um, more enclosure roof space to get in this tenant space. So it's, it's literally trying not to lose all that space. And there are opportunities to, to dry flood proof the uh the enclosures and the systems, or is that, that, not, that is not feasible? feasible. I mean, we on a good day, we have some pumps working down there. Any structure that's along the waterfront is fighting through a battle in terms of trying to keep it dry. It's a matter of how little water you can keep in there. It's not a matter of can you get an air tower or water type. You pump as much grout into the wall as you can, and it still finds water to find its way. So there's no, it, it, if it was a sandy that it hit here, I think you've all heard about it, but there's no way you can get that water out fast enough, uh, even with blockading at the entrance, the point of which is so saturated, it's going to come in. Can you say what would you need to get 
add additional stories or just well, I think what we would try to start to do is looking at what space is up there to enclose uh, to put it in. But yes, and, and it may not just be us, I'm sure there's other property owners too that would look for some relief uh, to try to do that. And that's why I think we talked about, or I remember hearing people talk about this is an option for creativity and how we look at what the municipal hardware plan allows. And if we have these two converging needs coming together, I think it's reasonable to put that on the table. <laughs> well, I think what's, they may do it. I think it'll wait till the 11th hour, and then we'll have a situation where we'll probably have um, buildings out of commission for much longer than they would have been. And it's, it's not good for the community, I think, to have that situation. Topic for our uh, climate change preparedness subcommittee that we'll look to convene a bit later. Uh, this aquarium. All right. Yep. Yeah. Anybody here has never been to the Aquarium? <laughs> <laughs> you get a personal tour for me. All right. Good. 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 So everybody knows where it is. I'm sure everyone, everybody's walking across our site. Yeah. 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 In the pipeline, there's no nothing designed for what I'm going to show you. Um, unless somebody wants to write me a check for about $25 million, it won't be designed for quite some time. Uh, but we've done a lot of work sort of laying out a, it's in the uh, upper right there. So. Oh, well, kids are already loaded in. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. okay. um, we've done a fair amount of work over the last several years. Uh, back first in 2007, and then more recently in 2012. We're developing really what's basically a conceptual master plan for the exterior part of our property um, to create a sort of roadmap to guide us to where we would go in the future. Okay. Yeah. Um, there, this is our site here. I hope everybody can see that. It's like That's a little light. Um, do you need. Uh So everybody does know this site. Um, we draw between 1.3 and 1.4 million people a year to this part of the waterfront. Uh, so we are the activator uh, in this part of the town, I think, as everybody knows. Uh, on the north side of the aquarium, we have a whale watch operation in partnership with Boston Harbor Cruises. That will draw this year somewhere between 75 and 100,000. 
a rail watch passengers in our IMAX theater on the south side of our property. We do somewhere between 240 and 3,000 theater goers. Many of them are in the same way but go to the aquarium. Um, we don't know exactly how many people go across or traverse our plaza, but it's probably something like two or three million uh, altogether. So this is a very, very active part of the waterfront. <coughs> a little history, you can see our property line here. We actually go out quite far into Boston Harbor. Um, we have the rights to develop out to the 1880 Harbor Line that you see here. No plans to do that at any point in the near future. It would be quite expensive to do that. Uh, but as you can see, we do go out to the curb on the city side, uh, and we own a little piece of the turf uh, adjacent to the IMAX theater. Um, most of our work, and I'll come back to this in a minute, in the last few years is focused on the inside of the building. Um, and uh, quite frankly, what's out front between <coughs> the main building and the city is not our best foot forward. Uh, you know, we try to make the best of it, we try to make it work. Next slide. Uh, but there's a lot of things that go on there that really need to be organized in a different kind of way, and that's what we really want to try to accomplish in the future. Next slide. Okay, so to... There we go. Exactly. Back, uh, back one. Okay, there we go. One more, I think, even back one. There, there you go. go. Sorry. Um, so what I'm really going to focus on here is the city side of our uh, property, talk a little bit about our adjacent environs. Um, over the last several years, I think, as most people know, we raised a fair amount of money, $43 million, and we spent about 35 of that starting on the harbor side and working through the main building to upgrade our facilities. So you're all probably very familiar with the Marine Mammal Center and the Harbor Terrace and the new Harbor Walk. Uh, we built a new Shark and Gray tank in the front of the building on the west side. We have a new Blue Planet Action Center that opened up uh, several weeks ago, and of course, an $18 million renovation of the giant ocean tank happy to say it's not leaking and working quite wonderfully. Um, and I hope if you haven't been down there, you come down and see it. It's really quite spectacular and we're, we're thrilled to have it. Um, and it's drawing even more people. So far, we're up about 20% over last year since it opened. So um, it's going well. Um, and the plan was to start out the water, work on the interior of the building, and then you know, over the next five, six, seven years, tackle this side of the property. Uh, next slide. We have a lot of things, a lot of stakeholders uh, to deal with uh, if you think about that front plaza, and I'm not going to go through all of this, um, but there's a lot of things happening there, a lot of people going across our party, property, we have a lot of neighbors. Um, probably one of the most important things that we think is a, is a need uh, or a problem to be addressed is there's no real identity. Uh, most people don't know that you're on the aquarium property when you're out there, unless you're waiting in line trying to buy a ticket. So that's something we want to work on going forward. Next slide. Um, we also have a difficult operational set of issues here uh, in that pedestrians are obviously coming in to buy tickets to enter the main building. We have to get service trucks in around to our loading docks. Uh, the IMAX has its own set of circulation issues, <coughs> etc. One of the things we want to work on is bringing our educational mission outside the building, and we've identified three nodes or three areas where we'd like to see that happen in the future. We also are involved in this very complicated space in the out in front of the aquarium between us and the uh, Fidelity Park, where there's a lot of activity, pedestrian, cars, uh, duck tours, trolleys, cruise, you know, uh, uh, tour buses, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, this, we know this is an area that we've got to work on going forward. I think a lot of good progress has been made in the last several years that it works much better uh, than it did uh, for a long period of time, but uh, still looking for improvement there. Next slide. Um, we have some great views now of the harbor from our property from here, and also from uh, the new work we've done on our harbor walk out here. Um, just if you're interested in now, we will do about 160 corporate and private events, including 40 weddings uh, on our property uh, during the course of the year. So it's become a very popular site. All of that creates some funding to help the bottom line of the aquarium allow us to do the mission work uh, that we're really set up to do. Um, this is an interesting area here. You know, when the park was built here, um, the Greenway was really not open yet. Um, uh, and now the Greenway is, and this fountain has created a new node of activity and possibly a new pedestrian link 
and something we think we should look at over time together with Fidelity and as part of this process. Perhaps that part could be tinkered with in a way that it might serve uh, as a connector a little bit more effectively than it does now. But we certainly welcome having trees there compared to what was before. Uh, next slide. I'm not going to cover everything in these slides because it's going to take way too long. Parking is a key issue for us, despite <clears throat> all of our efforts to encourage people to walk, to come by the T, uh, and to park uh, elsewhere. Uh, there's still about a uh, very large fraction of our visitors park in that garage, mostly because they're families. You all know they have strollers, they've got lots of bags, and so on. Um, these different graphs show you different times of the year. The key point is, on any given day during our busy periods, there may be two or four hundred, to hundred to four hundred cars, aquarium visitors parking at any one time in that garage. So parking is very important to our future. Next slide. <clears throat> you can just run through about, there's four slides here that you can go right through. We looked at the various sun and shade studies that have been done uh, by the BRA and uh, by the Shaparo companies and others for various proposals that were put in the pipeline that are now, long, now no longer uh, go, go back one or two if you would. Uh, we look at um, you know how different development um, of different heights on the garage site that's going to probably happen at some point might affect our plaza, particularly because we're looking at renovating the plaza and want to install a number of outdoor uses uh, there. Uh, the important thing to know, uh, no matter what happens there, is that when you go about above about 150 to 200 feet, you start going higher than that. We do get a fair amount of shade certain parts of the day, really not for more than a couple of hours, which is a good thing, but those couple of hours are during the peak visitation time of our visitors on our closet. So um, that's something to be looked at as we go forward. Next slide. Um, we talked a little bit, I think the BR, one of the areas that was really congested was in front of legal seafood here. Uh, the BRA has really done a good job in moving those vendors um, out to the boardwalk, as they mentioned earlier, and getting rid, I think, of a couple of them. So this area is dramatically improved in terms of its circulation. Um, I think, as I said earlier, we've done a lot of good work here. I think there's more to be done. Um, one thing we'd like to think about, you know, whatever happens on this parcel of the garage, if this area can be opened up a little bit more, I think it would enhance everybody's ability to have a much better circulation system in there. As I mentioned earlier, this park, which, which Unfortunately, I think the present doesn't serve as a great link between the Greenway and the aquarium and the waterfront. You can look at that. Sorry. I guess it's a bad idea. Some reason, yeah. easier than it was 43 years ago. It requires very little treatment, which is a real testimony to what we've done out there. Uh, but because of that, because we use a lot of salt water in our other tanks, we are a designated water-dependent use. We're actually in the original legislation for Chapter 91. So, uh, so for the use, like say, if you wanted an uh, additional density of uh, building footprint, um, it would be exempt as a water-dependent use. I believe that's correct. Yeah. Can I ask just a question about that? Sure. Um, you sell the uh, dolphin rights to the um, washing. I don't know the answer to that. Jim, do you have any idea? Can we sell the dolphin rights to the washing? That's a boy, a, a legal question more than a planning question. Um, I don't think it's something we've ever considered. Yeah. Not sure. I should. I, I we should. have enough money to withstand the legal proceedings. <laughs> 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 Okay, so let's keep going. 
So one of the big problems we have, and we're well aware of this, is that if you're walking out here, uh, particularly if you're from Germany, Austria, or Japan, it's really hard to find the aquarium. Uh, and a lot of that dates back to signage restrictions when the aquarium was built back in uh, 1969. Um, so we have various ideas. You can go to the next slide. One are, you know, what kinds of things could we do to increase the visibility? So again, make it real clear. This is a place that's about the oceans. You know, uh, and add some graphics. And again, these are just ideas. Nothing can be proposed. Unless you like. Unless you like. Next slide. Um, you know, some kind of way that we create an access through here um, uh, to sort of guide people with this new linkage uh, and get them to the aquarium. I think would be very helpful. Next slide. Uh, don't know what that would be, but we like uh, what happened, what was talked about earlier with the walk to the sea down in Longmore, where we have those wind turbines uh, powering the LED lighting. Next slide. Um, our, we really lack a consistent uh, pavement design here on our front plaza. It's been torn up for any number of reasons, including the big dig uh, and things that we've done ourselves. Next slide. Um, so we need to figure out some way to get a more consistent, much better design pavement system in there, and that's a key priority as we go forward. Uh, next slide. <clears throat> Here was an idea, perhaps, of creating some kind of promenade down the garage, adjacent to the garage, either the existing garage or something would happen there in the future. Again, trying to create an access uh, down to the waterfront of the aquarium. Next slide. <clears throat> It'd be wonderful to think about a way to open up some views of the water um, from that part of the greenway again, which I think is going to be uh, over time. Anybody has any water, I can do something. Next slide. Thanks. Uh, next slide. So as we look at, <coughs> excuse me, better, as we look at the plaza, there's a number of things that we'd like to accomplish. Uh, right now, we collect tickets in three places: in the overhang, in front of the seal pool that everybody knows, in the IMAX theater. Uh, online and you know lots of other things that you can imagine. Um, and, and there's a whale watch booth out here where tickets are collected from the whale watch. We'd like to consolidate all of those in one place, closer to the curb. Uh, again, to begin, begin to give some identity to our class and make it clear that you're, you're at the New England Aquarium's property. Our cafe that is there currently, uh, there's no plumbing, so it's very limited seasonal use. Um, a little bit hard to operate, but we do it pretty well. Like to build a permanent cafe and grill, you know, out in that area. Um, we would move the uh, ticket structure, uh, the ticket booths out from under that stainless steel awning and put it out here, which would open up that whole area um, to a better viewing of the seal exhibit itself and a place where people could congregate. And again, work on all of this paving to organize it more effectively than it does. Next slide. Again, these are not things to propose, but just to give you an idea of uh, you know, what we might do differently out there. Next slide. Um, this would be you know, some kind of ticket structure there. It would be a really challenging place to design something you know, appropriate, keeping in mind the stainless steel wing-like structures of the aquarium, uh, the telephone building that we just heard about, and everything else around there. We think it would be really great to consolidate that and organize it in you know, one building. We looked at, in the PRI study, there were ideas of moving, uh, uh, creating a ticket uh, structure that would be on the garage property. We think it makes it much too complicated and confusing for our visitors and would be difficult to operate. We prefer to see it uh, on our own turf. Next slide. Uh, this was an idea, again, to create some identity for the aquarium, make it visible from the greenway, perhaps put a structure like this in an IMAX building or something similar to that that would Make it real clear where the new aquarium is. Next slide. One of the other ideas that came out of this process is to put a 30 by 40 foot LED screen on the north side of our aquarium. I mean, of the IMAX building. You've all seen the screen out on WGBH in Alston. They have a big problem in that they have a highway underneath it, so they were not allowed to have moving pictures. So if you notice, it's all still photos that move very, very slowly. We think it would be wonderful to put a really sophisticated, high-tech, high-resolution screen on our side of the building. There's no highway to distract. There are no residences looking at it, but you have two or three million people using this space all the time. We would show high-definition underwater film. We could bring our webcasts from inside the tanks to outside the building. All, again, part of 
bringing our mission outside and uh, conveying a better identity for the new employer. I'd love to do that. I'll be two million dollars if anybody wants to write a check. You can write one. <laughs> Next slide. And then on the south here, um, I think she was what eight years ago when we upgraded this this whole south pier and the, this and this uh, this part of the hard walk to about this line back here, uh, right. just below the IMAX building. One of the ideas I mentioned earlier was to have a sort of education teaching node in this area. So the idea is to build a bridge on pilings that the tide can flow underneath to make another connection out to this harbor walk, both to draw people out here, but also be a fairly unique place to do an exhibit on how the tides work. You wouldn't believe how many people come from the Midwest, and they see the waters down 10 feet, and they know what happened, you know, was there, was there a catastrophe? So some explanation of that would be really great. It'd also be a great place to explain sea level rise and what's going to happen in the future. Uh, and also a great place to talk about marine life and a title zone. It'll be free and open to the public. Next slide. And a couple more. Um, just, you know, uh, back one. Just a whole bunch of ideas and, you know, how to make that a really lively, learning place. Again, during our mission outside of the building. And then uh, if you go back, maybe just two real quick. Uh, one more. We have this floating dock out here. Um, we have an agreement and a covenant that restricts its use to vessels no bigger than 49 passengers. Um, I'm very pleased to say that um, there's going to be a new cultural connector starting there probably August 1st that Boston Harbor Cruises is going to do. It's going to connect the New England Aquarium, the um, Children's Museum, and the ICA and family here. And consistent loop. They'll have about eight or nine uh, trips a day. It's a vessel, I think it's going to have 48 passengers, so it fits. <coughs> and it's low enough to go under the Northern Avenue Bridge. Uh, Except at the really high tides where the sea has now higher and they can't get under. But you can see it at the north side of uh, right. the right now. And I think you know, this will be an excellent use of that uh, the part of our problem. Next slide. Now we'll catch up. Keep going? OK. Good. Um, so there's a number of things that we want to do to the building, uh, and particularly parts of the building that link you know, directly with outside uses. Um, we've worked a lot on the inside. We built the new Marine Mammal Center and upgraded this part of the Harbor Walk. The giant ocean tank was just finished a few weeks ago. Um, we have major challenges with our lobby that we want to work on. Uh, and we also uh, wanted to look for an area where we might install more classrooms. Uh, next slide. Oh, and also we've looked at how to improve the exterior of the building. Um, was one of those concrete, um, Jim, I don't know, do you have a better word than behemoth, but I can no. use uh, when it was built, you know, 43 years ago, it was the City Hall era. Uh, it was the pre-Harbor Towers era. Um, it works pretty well if you want to hold a lot of water and have a lot of strong, you know, a lot of tanks inside, but uh, I think everyone agreed it's not the most attractive building uh, in the city. But we looked at a number of ideas, and you can go to the next slide, you know, simply how could we go from this to something much more attractive by cleaning up the exterior concrete, concrete sealing it and painting it. Uh, one more slide. Um, and you know, how might that look from, from the water? It'd be very, very different than it is today. You know, if you've ever made a renovation to an old house, um, you know, we've built the new um, Marine Mammal Center out here, which is brand new, and it makes what look behind it a lot less attractive and brings out sort of the oldness of it. So uh, the key question for us is, yeah, sure, you can fix it up and seal it and paint it once, but how often would you have to do that to keep it up and how much would it cost? So I think we're going to look at that pretty carefully. Next slide. Those windows. What's that? With those windows. So no, graphics. Those, uh, windows will not work unless you like a lot of algae and all yeah, that. Sir. These are different panels for yeah. different paint. Uh, one of which has a lot of animals on it, I think. Um, our lobby uh, is you know, fairly congested today. Um, when these new wings were built about 12 years ago, uh, I don't know what for a reason, but I think the lobby got shortchanged in terms of its, uh, lack of proper circulation. <coughs> Next slide. So one of the things we want to look at, this is the existing stainless steel structure, perhaps building another canopy underneath that with a similar design so we can bring the doors out further to create a much bigger lobby. Next slide. Um, and that would allow us to see how much bigger this space is than the current space. We would have a clear entrance and exit pattern that we can segregate out to make, uh, eliminate a lot of the congestion uh, in our main lobby. Next 
Next slide. Uh, almost regardless of what happens to the future of the garage, uh, we'd like to figure out how to bring our classrooms um, into the main building or at least closer to the main building. Um, we have, what is it, I think two or 3,000 square feet of space that we use for our classrooms, and those are kids, you know, grades K through 12 <coughs> in uh, elementary school, middle school, and high school. So we wanted to try to see if we could find a way, particularly if we do get displaced, uh, you know, in the next several years, um, where could that go? Next slide. So we've, I think, figured out a pretty clever way to build a second floor on top of what is now the Shark and Ray tank, for those of you who've been in there, in the West Wing, uh, where we can add a couple of classrooms and create some more office space. Next slide. Uh, so the, the city is over here, the harbor is over here. Uh, this is the main lobby right here. This is where the Shark and Ray exhibit is. It's only one story. So we would build a second story on top of that, get two or three classrooms, some office space for our educators, and so on. The big advantage would be they'd be right next to all of our tanks uh, and would really enhance the educational experience to get them in there more easily. Next slide. A little complicated to design, but we think there's a way to do it that you know, would go with and replicate uh, the stainless steel wings that are you know, currently there today. That's about a $4 million item. <laughs> uh, and then finally, we looked at uh, uh, you know the the uh, east side of, of our harbor, we've, as I mentioned earlier, we've done this new Marine Mammal Center. We've upgraded the harbor walk basically to here. One of the things we need to do in the future is finish the harbor walk on the north side. Um, because of sea level rise and other reasons, we will probably look at raising that a couple of feet higher than it is today um, as we raise this one, mostly for operational reasons, but also thinking about climate change. Does anybody remember the Shinku statue <coughs> sculpture that used to be on our front plaza? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's lying outside over in South Boston. We still have it, and uh, it doesn't work for a variety of reasons on the front plaza anymore. But uh, if you go to the next slide, uh, you probably can't see this, but one idea we had this is photoshopped in was to put it out on a new extension of that pier over the water. Um, and it would be great. You can see it from the ICA, so it would be kind of a rather nice you know, connection between those two cultural institutions. Uh, it would be a great landmark for the Aquarium. It's actually um, simulates two whales swimming in the water through the uh, million and a half. Anybody want to write a check? <laughs> 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 And then the last thing I want to show you, uh, right now we have next to the Marine Mammal Center a tent. That most of you know it goes up in the spring, comes down in the fall. Um, we have sitting there for up to 400 people at a, at a big event, as I mentioned earlier. We do about 160 events a year. It's a really important source of revenue to help our educational and conservation mission. Um, next slide. Um, so one idea we've had is uh, to the left is the Marine Mammal Center, which is now built uh, to build an open-air pavilion, which would be of similar design. I think aesthetically it would be a really great fit back there and uh, eliminate the need for us to have to take, uh, put up and take down the tent uh, every year. Uh, we could use that for corporate events. We could use it for you know, private events. We could use it for educational purposes. We would try to keep an open pavilion 24-7 to the public so it would provide some shelter uh, from the rain when we're not using it for events. But, uh, I think we had a really distinctive quality of the new work from the water as well. Last slide. So just to wrap up, you know, a number of things that I think would be the first priority for us to really improve the coherence and identity and the flow on our front plaza, uh, building some educational components uh, where the seal tank is, where, uh, where the uh, terrace is just below the IMAX theater, possibly bring back the sheet and sculpture out over the water, uh, move our classrooms from the garage over to here, build out the lobby a bit, build a new open air pavilion and out the water. Um, none of this is designed. We're not going to any permitting process at this point in time. Uh, probably all together we need something between 20 and 30 million dollars. That will be a cornerstone of capital projects for our next campaign. We'd love to have help with it, of course, but um, we really haven't started focusing on that just yet. So, any questions? Great, thank you, bud. Sure. Garage site, and uh, I understand there's a couple of proposals there. So the park goes away and it's all Can they offer a discussion with you? Any other thing that would be 
I have not heard anybody suggest parking has to go away. And maybe the Chicago would like to answer that. One of the options, is my understanding, is to consider it. That's not from the Chicago company. There is no option where the parking goes away. Yeah. And I think the zoning and other reasons, this is a very strong precedent that says parking has to be provided you know, on that site. So. If it is less, how would that impact? Um, you know, it, it depends. Uh, as, as I said, and you know, uh, Shavar Cup is very helpful in trying to figure out with us how many people actually park there on any given day. It's quite variable during the times of the year. You know, June, for example, when the is seems very busy, it's supposed to school bus, you know, group tours who are there. Uh, during vacation weeks in April and February, it's a very heavy load, you know, probably four or five people at a time. Are, are at any given hour during the day are parking in there for payments of the aquarium. You know, probably the average during the year, you guys correct me if I'm wrong, is probably somewhere between 200 and 400 cars at any point in time during the day, most intensive, you know, during the middle of the day. So we definitely need to have that. And, and, you know, as I said, being a green organization, if we could wave a magic wand and say, you know, everybody get here on another way, uh, you know, we'd figure that out. But a lot of our patrons are families and, you know, really need to come there. Uh, Greenway shuttle connecting North and South Station might be a way to alleviate some of that. Um, but again, they carry a lot of bags. You know, one of our biggest challenges inside the aquarium are SUV strollers. Right. Um, <laughs> take up an enormous amount of room. How many spaces are So a couple of things. One 
the property owners as to what their future outlays are as it relates to public realm and surrounding areas. Okay. The public working together with you are trying to figure this thing out because it's kind of an integration of these efforts in some ways. Um, and so I think that would be the second is that it might be worthwhile as we kind of get the public open in the back of it, it might be worthwhile as to that mm -hmm. to some more detail on their relationships and kind of filling in both in terms of uh, their own related property, but what equally important, what might be outcomes that relate to the substitutions or you know, processes that they can help Yeah, yeah what well, we so get, yeah. I'd like us to at least consider that and I'm going forward, and I, I, I think it would be a helpful part of making a complete plan. Yeah. I'd yeah. be very happy to bring you a shopping list of about 18 offsets. <laughs> I already realized that you use this as a fundraising opportunity. <laughs> So it fits in with what you said before, Rick, which is that it's possible in other locations. I know that on the Four Point Channel, that we've established a precedent for certain offsets um, and substitutions, not to be on, you know, to on the property, but to be in the planning district. And it's possible that somebody that wanted to maybe strengthen their hotel might find that what we might want them to do is help strengthen your closet. Lois, did you have a question? I was going to say, this is a personal note. I know that you're focused on like, walking this way, but I want to do that way. really helped is eliminating a lot of this congestion, you yeah. know, as, um, as we said earlier. Um, I think there's still an issue of, you know, the trolleys and buses. And so, you know, originally the trolleys were all supposed to be moved out here. And that creates other problems, as we've heard from our friends on the State Street building earlier. So it is a bit of a jigsaw puzzle that I think needs constant attention um, as, as more and more people come down to the bottom. And Chris, to pick up on what Chris just said, what hits me is everybody has their plan. Mm -hmm. The coordination, particularly what um, VRA was saying about the support needs and all the related impacts that we really, this is such an ideal opportunity not to incur a to just layer on, but to make sure that there is some real coordination on um, the support space, the infrastructure, infrastructure the yeah. of all of this. And I'll, you'll learn my theme song is traffic and pedestrian thoroughfare. All of this really gets affected. Um, any questions, comments from public on any of the presentations today? Chris? Uh, I just wondered about it. Have you ever considered putting an administration building on what you call the West Plaza? There's a lot of battery space there. Uh, as long as Robert Gill's alive and is on our board, uh, you know, we're, we're pretty happy to be over at the, what we call the cast uh, internally. I, I don't think, I think it would be, you know, we, we laugh a lot that um, when the aquarium was built because we were the first of its kind with a big round tank. Every other aquarium in the world at that point had tiny little rectangular tanks like a library. Nobody knew how many staff it took to run uh, the aquarium. And, it, you know, what do we have, Jim? Maybe offices for 40 or 50 people over there. Come on. And we have 249 people on the staff, um, which is, and a lot of that work on conservation work all over the world their offices, a lot are in education. You know, that office space in here, in the garage, as the Shamar company knows, is really important to us. We probably got 75 people in there. And then we have another 50 over here in the uh, Roberts building. Um, I think it would be kind of a shame to figure out how to move all those people into this limited space. We really should save that for the aquarium's main function, you know, in that area. Um, we often say, if you don't wear boots on your job, you don't have an office, you know, over in that part of town. Ma'am, did you have a question? Yes. yes. Um, so you said relating to all the presentations today. Yep. Um, you were talking about removing the people from the end of Lawn Wharf and now you with the van. I'm sorry? Moving moving the, the, the homeless? homeless? Yeah. The end of 
long walk at night with a van. There's another area that's a real problem area that's not the end of long walk. And it's right, it's in the garage building where the 7-Eleven is. The Harbor Garage building? Yes. Okay. It's a really creepy corner right there where the 7-Eleven is. Okay. Um, if, if you could, uh, uh, maybe we could I just get your contact information after the meeting. I can inform Jim Green, who's head of our emergency shelter services, and he uh, directs folks to go out and, and meet with these, these individuals that are you know, mustered in certain areas to see if we can get them into the shelters for the evenings. But if we can get more specific as to the location so I can pass that on to Jim, that'd be great. Thank Thanks. Yes, sir. Just because we operate the terminal on the north side of Long Wharf, I think you know one thing over there is really detrimental to water operations is pick up drop off area, you know, for either you know uh, materials, but people in particular. I mean, people going to the Boston High Island is growing at about you know 15 to 20 percent a year, yeah. and you know people go out for a day, think they going out for a week, but it's like uh, you know they and they're just you know they're trying to park can't find it and they you know and so how do you get them in and out of there I think I mentioned even the marina you know another area back there and the parking along the waterfront I'm sure it's not the highest and best use of the developers but that's what people want to need okay thank you yes would the retail along the new retail around the, the hotel would that be year round or you see the Yanni the thought is that those would be fully enclosed Condition spaces so it will be year round, not TS is fully enclosed in conditions, but it's not year round. Uh, but it's, it's a Years ago, why the BRA is allowed to have 
parking lots along the edges of the sea of New York. We have a side from Sport that can run that too. We should have been uh, many, many years ago. Uh, but I don't understand the value of parkland right next to commercial activity, right next to the commuter boats, right next to the vents for the charters. And what value does that bring compared to the value of Christopher Columbus Park? And now think about the value that's brought to the public by the end of our and what that could be. So I'd like to understand at some point what the net public benefit is of shifting open space from this incredible end of the world where you have the most amazing views of Boston Park to an area that's next to uh, red restaurant trash, restaurant vents, and commercial boat activity. <coughs> Thank you. Any other questions on the presentations today? Yes. On the subject of crash, I've had another question. No one wants a dumpster or even a barrel in front of their front door. We understand that very well. Your sketch, Harold Johnson's sketch, shows. Uh, dumpsters next to the Chicago's, two of its Chicago's is being on the right hand side. Uh, who owns that property that has the Chicago's containers? So that's being thought of. The Chicago's property? Right? Yeah. Well, the the property where the dumpster is shown in the Carroll yeah, I think that's on the, on the Bureau parking lot. And we would <coughs> show the dumpster there because we recognize we had any property in this business. So it's nothing. That, that sketch is very much in concept. Okay, thank you. Thank you to all our presenters today. Appreciate you taking the time coming in. We'll be seeing more of you, I'm sure, in the weeks and months to come. Um, just briefly, the request for notice to proceed, which again is the city's uh, scope for this planning effort. Uh, point of much discussion for our last meeting. Um, I did receive uh, some comments um, after our uh, June 26th meeting. Those have been incorporated into the document. Um, received some comments today from a few more uh, members, so I'll be incorporating those, and we hope to have that submitted uh, soon to uh, uh, CZM. And again, there will be a 30-day public comment period once that is in, so we'll uh, uh, keep you all apprised of the submission dates and when that will be available for public comment. Um, just another housekeeping note, there will be no advisory committee meeting in the month of August, so we'll reconvene uh, September 25th, um, likely be at the Boston Harbor Hotel, but I will, uh, I don't know if we're going to have coffee and cookies, but, <laughs> but uh, we'll, we'll see what we can do. I'll, I may be baking myself for that one. Um, but uh, again, uh, all the presentation materials are available through our website. Um, and uh, please get in touch if there are any questions, comments, or concerns. Thanks, thanks much for coming out today.